Good morning. Good morning. Welcome this morning, any visitors we have worshiping with us. We invite you to return and worship with us at any of all our services. Uh, I've got a couple of announcements this morning. Uh, Christian Ed, just a reminder that next Sunday after worship, we'll be having a meeting uh, to discuss, uh, form the new Sunday school class for college age students. Very important meeting. Uh, Circle two will meet. Tuesday morning at 10.30 in the fellowship building. And today is the last day to order t-shirts. If you'd like to purchase a t-shirt, please see Robin Burgess. And also there's a sign-up sheet. Uh, church plans on having a float in the Old Soldiers Reunion Parade. If you'd like to ride on the float, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the North X. If you will, put your name on there. And also the order form for the pictures is on the table in the back also. Uh, Brent Stewart's got an announcement. Okay, so um, I, uh, I just wanted to follow up on some of the call committee updates. Uh, the call committee has passed uh, the pastor's name on to the church council. The church council met with uh, Pastor Warfel about a week ago. Things went went well and so uh, the next steps that have been decided are that uh, Pastor Warfel will come and lead worship on August 14th so that'll be a good day for you to be here um, and we'll get a chance to not only hear him lead worship but also um, that is a uh, that's a lunch Sunday and so we're gonna we're gonna impress him with how much we can we can feed him um, and uh, and so that's also going to be just a good chance for us to socialize, get to meet the Warfels, and, and get a feeling for who they are and, um, and what that, that calling here at St. James might be like. Um, then, David, if I understand correctly, um, the vote to accept Pastor Warfel would be scheduled on the 21st. Is that right? On the 21st. And so... Um, you know, we need you to be here on the 14th to meet Pastor Warfel. We need you to be here on the 21st so that we have a quorum so that we can have that meeting so that we can accept Pastor Warfel. Or, you know, see, see which way um, you, you reflect on after you've had the chance to meet him. I don't want to presume on that, but I'm, I'm very hopeful, and we certainly felt like Pastor Warfel was someone that, that you would be uh, pleased with. So, so hope, hope for the best, but I uh, want to give you the chance to meet him. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, at that point, Pastor Warfel has, has commitments, and we'll have to work out a, a point where he would begin with us. Um, but, uh, you know, Pastor Orovitz is going to be with us for, for a little bit, and we certainly want to be thinking about him as we go through all this and just the, the wonderful service that he has, has given to the church uh, and allowed us to, to work through this period and continue to move forward and be constructive as a as a church body and so you know as you think about all the all the things that are happening with the new pastor and get excited I, I, I'd ask that you also take a moment to, to think about all that that we've been blessed with from Pastor Orovitz and to thank him thank you David thank you Grant are there any other announcements this morning I have a few names to add to the prayer list Dottie Eisenhower Ira Klein and the family of Otto Bost which was a Peter Boston's brother. Are there any other names to add to the prayer list? Elaine. The father, I mean the family of Frank Thompson. Family of Frank Thompson. Yes. And also the family of Greg Campbell. Family of Greg, Greg Campbell. Campbell. Are there any others? If not, let us prepare our hearts for worship. To pray, Lord.
Let us rise as we share the brief order for confession and forgiveness. We have gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by that authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, your kindness is far more than we desire or deserve. Generously pour out your mercy to forgive where our conscience is afraid and to provide that for which, by ourselves, we do not even presume to pray. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. The first lesson comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, and a striving after wind. I hated my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also this also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. 
What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For, his, for all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases God, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to <coughs> give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The psalmist, Psalm 100, found in your hymnal. The second lesson comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Luke, the twelfth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And Jesus said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. 
And he said, well, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Invite all the young people to come up and to join me now. Oh, we got a couple. Good. <laughs> a couple guys. You'll be good at this, I think. You know, because I got a ball here and I got a bucket. The ball, you know, just barely fits in the bucket. It's like a basketball in a hoop, huh? Yeah. Can you uh, stand up and can you throw the ball into the bucket? Oops. Move, move a little closer. Move a little closer. Can you throw the ball in the bucket? Good, good. You want to try? Let's yeah, see if you can do that. Move a little closer. <laughs> okay, yeah. Now. Now I, got, I want you to do it again, but this time stand up and I want you to close your eyes and throw the ball. Keep, keep your eyes closed. Throw your ball in a bucket. Oh! oh. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, let's, let's do that again. Stand up, close your eyes, turn around. Okay, throw the ball in the bucket. No. <laughs> it was hard. You can do it? Okay. Stand up. Close your eyes. No. <laughs> okay. You know, it, it, it's, uh, you gotta, if I was talking to you, you know, and you were looking at me and you were trying to get the ball in the bucket, you'd probably miss because you weren't focused on the bucket, right? When you aren't focused on the bucket, it's hard to hit the target, right? So we've got to keep our eyes. We've got to keep our eyes focused on where they need to be. And that's the same thing in life. And in the reading that we just heard, you know, Paul was saying that to his Christian friends. He says, he says set your minds on things that are above. In other words, Set your mind on Jesus and not on the things that are around you. Because, you know, when, you, when, when, our, when our eyes are focused on the things around us or they're closed, we can't see the target. <laughs> and we'll miss the bucket. And so uh, when we focus on Jesus, what happens? What do you think happens in life when we keep our eyes focused on Jesus? Why does that make life different? We what? Okay, when our eyes are focused on Jesus, we, we, we're trying to be like him, right? We're always wondering, what would Jesus do? And, and so we keep our eyes focused on Jesus. And what, we do, what do we do when our eyes are focused on Jesus? You read the Bible more and pray more and go to heaven. <laughs> you're more loving, you're more caring, and uh, you look after the needs of others, you know. You're filled with kindness and mercy and goodness. That's when our eyes are focused on Jesus. Uh, and like Jesus says, we will do unto others as others have done unto us. But what happens when our eyes are focused somewhere else? Like on our friends and on the world. What happens then? Well, what happens, you know, we... Well, sometimes we'll do what our friends are doing, right? <laughs> and sometimes what our friends are doing might not be the nicest things, you know? And so when, when our eyes get off Jesus, we, we run into trouble. 
And so we want to remember uh, to keep our eyes focused on Jesus always. So could we, we uh, pray and ask Jesus to help us do that? Lord Jesus, help us to keep our eyes always focused on you so that we can hit the target of your love as we are kind and generous and patient and share your goodness with others. We ask you to help us do this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for coming up. And let us pray. We thank you, Father, for your word contained in Scripture. And we thank you for its reading and its hearing. We ask now, Lord, that your word may take root in our lives and that the way we live our lives may reflect your dreams for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Some of you here are farmers. I don't know if any of you are here, any of you here are dairy farmers, though. Uh, but you may, if you're a dairy farmer, you know something about cows, you, you'll be familiar with what I'm going to talk about. For the rest of us who don't know much about dairy cows, did you know that a cow has two stomachs? They have two stomachs to digest their food that they eat. Well, unlike cows, <laughs> people don't have two stomachs. But we do have two hungers in life. And to satisfy our needs, we need to fill our stomach with food. That's the primary, our primary hunger in life. We need to eat so many calories per day so that we have energy to, to live and to go on. But in addition to that hunger for food, we also have hunger for other things too, the intangible things in life. We, need, uh, we have external needs. We need a roof over our heads. <laughs> we need clothes to keep our bodies warm and covered. And we need all those practical things that money can buy. So we've got to have a job. We have to need, have some source of income. Those are part of that physical hunger that we have. But we have another stomach, too, that needs to be fed. And here we're talking about those internal needs, not the external needs. The internal needs, the intangible things that we need in life, because we have a hunger for lots of stuff. We're hungry for love. We're hungry, hungry for attention. We're hungry for happiness and joy and acceptance and sharing and worship and giving and helping. And though, when those things are filled and they're there, it gives us a feeling of fulfillment in life. And we we have the we have this feeling, especially when we're doing things for others, that, you know, life has a purpose. And these are things that money cannot buy. And if both of these hungers, the external one and the internal one, are not fed, we get into trouble. We're not happy people. You can have the best paying job in the world. But if you aren't getting any appreciation or respect in your work, you're not going to be happy. And all the best wishes and all the best thoughts in the world won't put food on your table so that you can survive and you can live. And so the fact that we have these two different kinds of hungers in life sets us up. For trouble. And it's what I'm calling today the devil's trick. The devil's trick. We have these two hungers that need to be fed, and the problem today is that they're confused. 
People have them confused in their minds. And it's been that way since creation, <laughs> since Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Those two things have been confused, and the devil had a part in it. He said, look at that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. You know, that gives you power. That gives you fulfillment, you know. And if you eat the, the fruit of that tree, you're going to get that. And so the devil tricked them <laughs> into eating the fruit of that tree. And so ever since, people have had this idea that you can satisfy the internal needs for happiness and self-worth with what satisfies the external needs in life. And so what, how that ends up, people end up believing that the more you have, the happier you're going to be. And that's the devil's trick. And today's gospel, that message becomes very, very clear to us. If you think you can satisfy your internal hunger with those external things like bigger barns, bigger homes, and more of everything to put in them, then, like the rich man, you have fallen for the devil's deception. And Jesus is more blunt than that. He's, it's, he calls the man a fool because he has fallen for the devil's trick. The rich man in our gospel reading is a fool because he let himself be tricked by the devil. And we see the consequences as you read this parable, you will discover that the rich man's speech, you know, that when he talks to himself and tells himself how great everything has turned out, his speech is exactly 62 words long in the English Standard Version that we hear read in worship. And in those 62 words, he uses the possessive pronouns, I and my nine times majority of the words used are those I and my. And so here we see a person who has said I and my so often that he has lost the capacity to say we and our or yours. His focus on all those external things that were supposed to satisfy his internal hunger for happiness blinded him to the fact that in life we live in interdependent relationships with others. And so here's this guy talking as though he's the one that plowed the fields and that he can build the barns alone. This person talks as though there's nobody else around but himself and what he has. And so he thus becomes a victim of a cancer that a doctor cannot cure or treat. And we see the evidence of this cancer every day. It's what is behind road rage. And it's behind what is uh, cruelty and rudeness. It causes people to treat each other badly as our society is becoming less and less civil. In most marriage problems, when there's problems in the marriage, the bottom line is that one or both of the partners are saying I and my so many times that they've lost the capacity to say we and our or yours. Now the rich man in the parable thought he could get along fine in this self-centered world, his self-centered world. He was an individualist gone wild because of the devil's deception. And you know what? <coughs> We're living in a culture like that that has gone wild 
in the same way. It is what I think and what I believe and what I want and what I need that counts today. It's about my rights and my entitlements. Forget about the we and the our and yours. But there are other consequences. Not only was this rich man's relationship to others broken, but his relationship to God was messed up. Just like he did not and could not see his independence, interdependence, I mean, on, with others, he did not see and could not see his dependence on God. He talked as though he is the one that unfolded the seasons and made the soil rich by himself. He seems to assume that he had the power to make the sun shine and the rains to come to produce those abundant crops. He sounds like he sees himself in control like the creator and not a creature of creation. And here again in modern life, we, there's lots of examples of how we do that today. For instance, we believe science has all the answers. Science will find the drug eventually that will cure cancer. Or it will discover a vaccine for the Zika virus, which is now the new threat on the horizon. So today we replace our dependence on God with a dependence on science or a dependence on the government or a dependence on ourselves. And so the Lord's Prayer is prayed in a new way by the secular humanists in our society. And this is the way the Lord's Prayer sounds. Our brothers and sisters, which art on earth, hallowed be our name. Our kingdom come. Our will be done on earth, for there is no heaven. Well, that's what the atheists say. There is no heaven. Without a sense of our dependence on God for everything, our relationship with him gets messed up. All our great efforts to solve our problems can turn to mud before our eyes. And so we find cures that don't cure, we find blessings that don't bless and solutions that don't solve a thing. No presidential candidate can promise a fix for our trouble because it's deeper than everything they're talking about. And the rich man in today's gospel did not see this. He was so involved with himself that he not only forgot others, he forgot God. He tried to fill his deepest hunger and the need for God with all those external things that satisfied his physical <coughs> hunger so that he could relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And you know what he got? He got a title. <laughs> He's called a fool. And that's how we know him forever, a fool, because he had fallen for the devil's trick. When we are driven by the I and the my in life, there are consequences. And the Apostle Paul talks about them in our second reading today in his letter to his Colossian friends. He writes this, he says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. In these things you too once walked, but now you must put them all away. And he lists them. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Those are the things that happen when we are driven by the I and the my in life. 
as we seek to fill only one hunger, the hunger for those external things. In our reading today, Paul says, we've been raised with Christ above all that. And so we are to seek the things that are above. Our deeper hunger for the intangible things that we need and are really hunger, hungry for. So we set our minds above the I and the my in life onto God, who will satisfy our deeper hunger for love and hope and forgiveness and happiness and joy, for acceptance and sharing and worship and giving and helping and every other feeling that really makes us fulfilled in life so that life, you know, feels like it has a purpose. Paul says we need to strip off the old self. He talks about putting on some new clothes. Clothe yourselves with a new self that's different, that lives in the image of its creator. And so there are consequences, too, for doing that. Our second reading ends at the 11th verse. And so we don't hear about those things because they, they're in the verses that follow. But I invite you, when you go home today, read the rest of the third chapter of Colossians. Paul writes then, he says, this is what we're putting on. Put on then, as God chosen ones, holy and beloved, put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And above all these virtues, put on love. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And be thankful. Those are the consequences when we set aside the I and the my. And we begin to live in the spirit of Christ as we think about the we and the ours and the yours in Christ. And so when we live like that, we're not falling into the devil's trick at all. When we feed both of the hungers in life, when we come to the end of our life, God will not say to us, you fool, like the rich man is going to hear. But instead, he will say, come, O oh blessed one, and inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you. The secret of our hope is in accepting the point of this teaching of Jesus, which clearly says one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, but in being rich toward God. Don't feed the one hunger we have in life and forget the other hunger. Beware of the devil's trick. Amen.
God satisfied the deepest hunger in our life the day we were baptized and made members of his family. And so we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to greet each other.
Let us pray together for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Dear God of eternal love, sometimes it seems that life is meaningless, a, like chasing the wind. Help us always to set our hearts on things that are in heaven above and empower us to give meaning to our lives by doing your work every day wherever we find ourselves lord in your mercy hear Amen. our prayer lord help us to be a generous and sharing people sharing the bounty of our successes sharing our time and talent sharing your word and sharing your love with your children in our own neighborhood and around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, help us to see others as you see them, as your children, rather than by distinctions of race, age, gender, economic status, education, or ethnic background. May we celebrate our differences and use our gifts together to the glory of your holy name in everything that we do. We pray for the North American Lutheran Church as it prepares for its annual convocation next week in Anaheim, California. We pray for the other meetings and the theological convocation that will take place there. Grant safe travels to all who attend these meetings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for those around the world who are persecuted for their faith, emotionally, politically, or physically. We remember Father Jacques Hamel in France, who was killed while leading worship in his parish in France. Be with all who grieve his death, as well as others who grieve their loved ones who have been killed by terrorists in recent weeks. Protect and encourage all police officers in their duties. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for people who choose lives of service, especially members of our military, firefighters, social workers, teachers, medical professionals. Be with them and their families as they serve others. And may we follow their example by using our talents to care for the needs of others. Be with our president, the members of Congress, our judges, and all who serve in public national, state, and local governments. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Comfort your people who are hurting today, all those who are ill, those in pain, and those who are hungry, and those who live in sadness and despair. We especially ask your blessing today upon our neighbors and friends, all those that are named in our worship bulletin, along with those who we now name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pour out your spirit on those who remember their own loved ones. Remind us that in you we have the promise of eternal life. We thank you for each one who has touched our lives especially those most near and dear to us who now rest in your arms. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. In peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.